Hi, I'm Shannon Steimel, and um, I am happy to present a quick mini conference this week called Gratitude 180, where I am celebrating some of the educators who I am grateful for um, because they have uh, influenced my thinking and um, my teaching practice. So today I'm going to kick this off with Dr. Amy Peach of Lindenwood University. And um, she taught an action research course that I took last uh, fall. And so I'll just start by letting her introduce herself and what she does at Lindenwood. Hi, so uh, my name is Amy Peach, and I'm an assistant professor of education technology at Lindenwood. Uh, I chair the uh, Master of Integrated School Library, Media, and Technology program, um, and I teach a lot of research classes, one of them being action research. Great, thank you. So, um, Amy, one of the first things that we did in the course is just talk about like what action research is and, and is not and how it would benefit an educator. Would you mind sharing about that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, because I took action research as part of my master's however many years ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, having worked in on my doctorate and, and now teaching in the university, I've kind of experienced a lot of different areas of research. And I think that the way that I kind of explain it to everyone is it's somewhere between formal academic research and just the common best practice examination of your data that good teachers do every single day. So it takes a little bit from, from both ends of that. And so essentially um, with action research, what you're doing is you're looking at a specific problem that you are experiencing in your classroom or your library or, you know, whatever part of education you're in. And it has to be a problem that you have not really been able to tackle. Um, it's something that's really bugging you. You want to try to figure out how to fix it. Um, but the very casual trial and error method that we typically use just isn't cutting it for you. And so uh, the reason I always tell people that it, it has to be something that fits those criteria is because action research is very, very involved. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And so it has to be a problem that you really care about. It doesn't have to be a problem that your school cares about or that, you know, the academic community cares about. And because it's something that's very, very specific and tailored to your environment. And so that's where I think the advantage is in conducting projects like this, that when you're, when you're all done with it, it's something that you know will apply to your classroom. Whereas if you read you know, some more generalized academic research, it may or may not pertain to your classroom. So that's in, generally speaking what it is. Great, thank you. Um, so when I was thinking about what problem of uh, practice that I wanted to investigate, um, one of my roles as a future ready librarian is to um, provide professional development for teachers in technology and then also to oversee their uh, professional goals that they have. Um, and so um, one of the things that I had come across a few years ago was this article from EdSearch about how um, technology in the hands of um, poor kids is often used for remediation, whereas their more affluent peers um, are using technology for lots of things, including creation. And so the idea of a, a new digital divide that was created by, um, you know, having kids who are merely consumers and those who are creators has formed and it's, you know, it's more than just a matter of access. And so, um, you know, I started with this, you know, kind of non-academic uh, just article that you would come across in your, you know, your normal, um, Twittering, I guess you could say, um, and it, it led me to my problem of practice where I wanted to figure out, you know, what, what is keeping my teachers from giving our students creation opportunities and what can I do to help them overcome those barriers. Um, so that's where my literature review started. Um, Amy, can you talk a little bit about why that, you know, like why the literature review is such an important component when we talk about like using um, evidence-based teaching practices? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's really important just uh, to not, well, I mean, the it's become kind of a cliche, but reinventing the wheel is something that, you know, we are always very concerned about in education. And so in order to figure out where you need to start in your 
project, it really helps to see what everybody else has already done. And so in, it's kind of an extensive process when you're going through the literature review because you're trying to go back to uh, a mix of scholarly sources and then, you know, some more, uh, you know, casual public articles, Twitter feed stuff that you're talking about. Um, what's interesting about it is that in having taught this course several times, if you're researching an area that is still very new in the literature, you're going to have a hard time finding a lot of scholarly work. It takes time to conduct academic research. And so the best example I have is flexible seating. I had a student who did a project last year. She could find almost nothing on it. And we went to reference librarians we went to multiple libraries we you know dug around everywhere we could find it just wasn't an area of substantial research at this time I've got a student this semester who's doing the same thing she found 12 sources so just within one year it's pretty incredible how um, academic research can kind of catch up to these trends but if you're looking at something that's super trendy and you know has really been going nuts on Twitter or Instagram it's entirely possible that there's no real solid research on it yet so what I always tell people about the literature review is number one it's important because you want to really understand other people have valuable lessons whether you do that kind of research or not they probably found at least one or two things that you know kind of inform your understanding of the topic so that you're not trying to examine the same sort of area and coming up with the same results that, you know, are not going to be very satisfactory to you. Um, but I do encourage people, and this is some, I, and I, I deviate, you know, a lot with my colleagues, um, and I had, I read on this one, but it doesn't have to be all scholarly work. We are at an age now where information is being collected very haphazardly. We have to be careful, you know, about how we apply it, but blogs, uh, videos on YouTube, uh, even tweets uh, can be valuable information for you. So uh, I would say to everybody, always start with the scholarly stuff, see where they're at because they have actually have to go through a process to show what's working and what's not. Whereas I could put anything on Twitter and, you know, I don't have to answer to anybody. <laughs> so you want to yeah. be careful about that. But it's, but it's helpful. It's helpful information to know where everybody else is at before you start. You know, this is my seventh year at my school um, and working with technology, and I feel like we've tried lots of different strategies for technology PD, but it wasn't until I did my literature review and found out, like, you know, what research actually says is effective PD, what are the, the things that um, cause teachers to you know, integrate technology and it has to do with teacher readiness, their beliefs, and then the availability of, of the devices. And so, um, you know, knowing that I was then able to, um, you know, conduct a survey with my teachers and find out, you know, for each one, what was it that was holding them back? And then, you know, what were the effective PD strategies that we could use to, you know, address that? So um, it was a really powerful um, practice for me. So, um, you know, one thing that is a piece of the uh, action research is data collection. And, you know, educators seems like they are bombarded with data these days and really encouraged to use data to inform their practices. So I was just curious um, of how you see uh, data collection analysis as part of an action research project, um, you know, how that compares to um, the, what we normally think of as, as data-driven instruction. Sure, yeah, and with all of the technology that we have now, um, it, it's really become a, a totally different ball game. And it's been interesting to watch because I think a lot of people in the field, um, because of this constant, constant push for data from the top down, they tend to think then that well that's just an administrative thing and it's just another hoop I have to jump through not realizing how valuable that can actually be when you're looking at it as a professional educator and I can see why you know a lot of people really feel um, kind of bombarded by this uh, teachers there's nothing that teachers are not expected to do now like <laughs> nothing there's, you're totally responsible for everybody all the time okay so it feels just completely overwhelming I, I totally get it um, but to make that part easier data really really can help 
And I think that the difference is, so the first time I really encountered it as a teacher, I was teaching for the Georgia Department of Ed for their online virtual program. And when I was able to look at the data on the back end from the students' use of learning management systems, and now if you have, um, you know, uh, PowerSchool or you know, any other grade system, regardless of whether or not you have Canvas or um, Schoology or Google Classroom, it can really tell you a lot about what's going on with the kid. You know, are they actually struggling with specific areas of content? Are they just not get, turning in homework on time? Uh, when I was working at Georgia, that data was so good that we got to the point where we could tell which kids were homeless based on that data. Oh, so wow. it, it, was, it was remarkable. So knowing how to use it is just an extremely effective way to to be a great educator with action research though it's a little bit different because we as a as a practitioner i can look at that and say oh wow you know look what's going on with this kid but when you're conducting an action research project part of what you need to do is actually take a step back from yourself and look at the data by removing your lens from it and that's something that generally speaking we don't do as educators we look at our data and we're looking for something there's something very specific that we're looking for. And if we don't see it, then we tend to dismiss all of the other things that the data is showing us that could be very useful. We just didn't realize that we were looking for it. And the best way for me to explain that um, is you can do a lot. First of all, people think data is numbers. Okay, let me be very clear. <laughs> it's not just numbers. Uh, there's a lot of really, really great um, information that you can get from interviews, from focus groups, um, from all kinds of qualitative data that can be extremely helpful. So interviews are, are probably the best example. So if I'm, let's say my biggest problem is I've got a group of kids in my classroom and they are just not engaged, they're not paying attention, they're not doing their homework, they just, they don't wanna be here, it would be totally easy for me to take their table and just remove it from my classroom and then everything <laughs> else will be fine. So I have to figure out how to deal with this group of kids here and they're driving me nuts. So I'm looking at their grades, I'm looking at all of the correspondence with their parents, I still can't quite figure something out, but it seems like there's something happening. So I'm gonna go and ask, you know, maybe the counselor. I know that they've been into the counselor's office multiple times. If I'm just trying to figure out the problem by myself, then I may just go ask that person. But if I'm creating an action research project, I actually formulate some interview questions and I go and talk to that person, I record it, I transcribe it, and the reason why I go to all that trouble is then when I go through, I start noticing trends, different things that this person is talking about, usually over and over and over again. So if I'm interviewing that person, and you know we're talking about one student in particular, and she keeps saying, mentioning his job, and this is, I'm bringing this up because it's happened to me one time, <laughs> she keeps saying, his job, his job, his job. I didn't, I wasn't asking about his job, but it kept coming up. And so as I go through this formal coding process, I can see that she's mentioned a job seven times, even though I never asked about it. So in working through an action research project, what I need to do then is go back to that counselor, it's called member checking, and say, hey, I noticed you mentioned this a lot. You know, it seems like this is an important issue with this kid. Do you want to is that right? Is that not right? Is there something else going on? And every time as a researcher I've done that, they always come back and say, you know what, I never thought about it that way. But yeah, you're right. I said, well, actually, you did think about it that way. You mentioned it seven times. You just may not be conscientious of it. So what's interesting about these methods is that it's a way for us to remove our lens so that we can see it, you know, with a very fresh perspective. The other thing with action research, out of a, you know, at Lindenwood, we teach it in 16 weeks. And we cover bias in like the first, second, second or third week, and then it gets hit, you know, about every month. It goes back and say, okay, are you sure that you're reading this data correctly? Are you, is there something about yourself that may be interpreting it in a way that's incorrect? And just trying to get better at your practice, we don't usually ask those questions. So I think that's where having a structure that Action Research provides really can, can be very beneficial in helping you take a step back from yourself so you can actually see the problem for what it really is. Great. Um, so I was curious, Amy, I know you mentioned, um, you know, the flexible seating example, you mentioned a few others. Are there just, are there any other like interesting uh, problems that educators that you teach have been investigating with action research? 
Oh yeah, it's um, it's definitely one of the best classes that I teach just because it helps me get a really good read on what educators are dealing with, you know, in the area. I, I know what's important to you if you're <laughs> going to go through this much work <laughs> and it's not just for a credit this is this is a lot of work for three credits you know of any yeah. graduate level um so if you're going to go to all that trouble and you know that <laughs> so you know how hard that was so if you're going to go to all that trouble you're going to look for something that's really important to you and flexible seating is definitely one that has come up in the last uh, couple of years um flexible schedules blended learning you know that kind of thing has come up a few times um the library students i teach genrefication has come up a few times uh reading literacy ebook use you know those things are, are always part of it um, what always surprises me though is engagement and motivation. A semester never goes by without that becoming a topic. And having to even define what engagement is has been very, very interesting because what engagement is is often cultural. We, we assume that you are engaged or not engaged based on the way that a student is presenting him or herself in a classroom. And we have to challenge those assumptions. So, um, you know, all of these things are a huge issue. Amy, uh, student motivation, it's funny you should mention that because that's what actually almost kept me from getting my master's because <laughs> the first time I took a research class, I had chosen a, a student motivation as my topic and I just wasn't motivated to finish it and I took it incomplete. So uh, that's really funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> that's uh, one of the reasons why I can definitely uh, recommend you and Lindenwood in this course um, if you do actually want to complete an action research project. Um, so do you have to be part of a, a master's program in order to take a class at Lindenwood if, if someone was interested in just, you know, doing this action research? No, no, you definitely don't. Um, and I, you know, offhand, I don't remember um, the exact tuition rate, but I know that education get a discount on top of that as well um, and it's really you know when I started Lindenwood I was kind of surprised because it's kind of comparably priced to most state institutions so to take three credits is not gonna break the bank for you um, but the other important piece of that too is I tell people there there's a couple different ways that you can look at this um, and next year I'm gonna look at actually forming a, a more informal group outside of Lindenwood just to explore this. So people just want to learn more about how this process works and how you can use it just to get better. It's, it's a, probably the most effective professional development method that, that I've ever encountered. I find workshops valuable. Um, I love you know web conferences like this. But when I have a very specific directive and there's something really particular that's driving me crazy that I need to fix, this is probably the best method that I have. So I think that if that's just your interest, um, then just get in touch with me. <laughs> you know, I don't have anything formalized yet. Um, but there, I have enough interest outside of Lindenwood to say, okay, maybe we should just like form a, a cohort and on our own and just kind of look at this. Um, but that's not going to get you credits towards your degree either. <laughs> so, so if you're actually looking, even if you're not really sure, even if you're not 100% sure about going back to school, if you think that you might, it might be a good idea to actually sign up for the three hours because then that will transfer. To my knowledge, there's really no um, hard and fast limit on the number of years. So if you go, you know, four or five years later, the credits should still transfer. Um, and this one in particular, this is uh, required for my program. It's required for education technology. I think it's quickly becoming an option for others because you're not just learning these methods, you actually have to apply it. And, you know, what I tell students too is you have to, you're going to experience failure here and frustration and your study is not going to go the way that you want it to and you might break a base in the process and that's okay. <laughs> um, you know, I just tell everybody just lean into the discomfort. It's not about the result that you get. It's about understanding the whole process so that you can keep doing it, you know, again, long after the class is over. Well, Amy, I really... I'm grateful for you. <laughs> if you oh, I'm grateful out, for you. I'm so you. I love these conferences that you put on, Shannon. These are just so fun and so informative, and I love passing them on to my students. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I want to, uh, you know, since we're talking about gratitude here, I want to give you a chance uh, to pay it forward. Is there uh, someone in education who you feel like has has influenced your teaching that you'd like to to, to give a shout out to, or you're thinking in a, in education? One. 
one person. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like asking a librarian uh, to pick their favorite book or something, right? But, um, you, like, I know, no kidding. Uh, how, <laughs> how do you even do that? Um, I think, well, I guess it depends on kind of who you've already spoken to. So I, did you just start this? Yes, you're my first person. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Okay. Um, oh God, there are so, so many people, but I will just say because, because we talked about flexible seating as a, a thing a few times, um, I would probably recommend Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca Hare is a uh, teacher with Clayton School District and she's a learning space design consultant who uh, talks a lot about how to create spaces that are facilitate learning. A lot of people I know in the region are already familiar with her work. Um, she's also a very good friend of mine and is, is so generous with uh, her time and her resources and her energy. And uh, So she's definitely somebody I would recommend. But I could give you a list of probably <laughs> 40 people in the region off the top of my head. Oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with, we'll stick with really, Rebecca for now. To anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I, her book that she wrote uh, with Bob Dylan, uh, Space, yeah. I recommend it all the time. I think I should get some kind of, like, kickback or something for I, 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 they sell because <laughs> I just I can't say enough good things about that book. We used that uh, when we were writing uh, our grant application for uh, Innovative Technology Education Fund, and and Rebecca actually ended up coming out after we got the grant and helping our art teacher to redesign her um, photography studio space. So uh, that was very exciting for us. Well, thank you so much, um, Amy. I really appreciate you kicking off this Gratitude 180 mini conference with you. Um, I hope you had lots of good turkey over the weekend and that you uh, enjoy the rest of what's left of the semester till break. Yes, we'll do. Same to you, Shannon. Thank you again. Thanks. Take care. You too. <laughs>